Welcome to Embargoed, a podcast featuring intelligent talk about sanctions, export controls, and all things international trade for trade nerds and normal human beings alike. I'm one of your hosts, Brian Fleming. I'm here, as always, with my friend, colleague, and co-host, Mr. Timothy O'Toole. What is up, Tim? Happy Friday afternoon, Brian. Yeah, it's, it's just time to talk more Russia sanctions. <laughs> time to talk about the same thing we've been talking about Ooh. for the last 10 hours straight. Yeah, exactly. exactly. Um, welcome, everybody, to the latest episode of Embargoed. Uh, thank you all for joining. Thanks to everybody who we heard from after our uh, Russia Megapod the last time. Uh, not surprisingly, this is going to be another Russia Megapod this time uh, because there is really nothing else to talk about uh, in our in our world, in our little sanctions trade nerd world. Um, but thanks to everybody for um, for joining um, and for all the good feedback we heard and and um, the interesting questions, comments, and other things that we've kind of heard from all all corners the last few weeks. Um, we obviously are. Um, we're recording this on March 18th. It's a Friday, as Tim said. It doesn't feel like a Friday. I feel I've kind of lost track of time. Time and space don't really have any meaning anymore because I feel like I'm just in my sanctions answering mode 24/7 these days. Um, so um, we are not surprisingly going to spend a good chunk of time talking about the latest and greatest that has happened the last two and a half weeks since we last recorded. On the sanctions and export controls front with respect to Russia, uh, at the tail end, we are also going to make a little bit of time for one lightning round topic, which is one of our favorites, JCPOA 2.0 and the fate of that and whether it is in fact actually going to happen or not. Uh, so we'll spend the last five, five or so minutes talking about that at the end of the program. Um, before we jump in, the normal reminders, we're not giving legal advice. We're not... Um, sharing any confidential information, anything that you hear today is solely the opinion of myself and Tim. If you disagree or dislike, blame us. Um, and uh, you can find us anywhere you get your pod content. Please subscribe if you like it. Please spread the word about Embargoed. And that's, I think, about it. Tim, any thoughts, any contemplations, any deep um, My deep thought reflections on this. anything? Yeah, One deep it. thought. Why is everything an emergency? That's what I want to know. Every question that I've gotten in the last three weeks has been an emergency. To and our loyal, all the emergencies. To our loyal clients out there, your emergency is always the most important. Exactly. Always the most important. Always. No one else has um, a more important emergency than any, you. <laughs> and I'm not working else. on anything else, so I can just jump right on your emergency. To anybody else, yeah. My favorite is now. Now this is this is treading into dangerous territory. But my favorite is when I'm on the phone for six straight hours and don't have time to respond to emails and then get second or third emails from people who are like, why didn't you respond to my email? Exactly. And then they call, I've been, I've been on the phone for text. six straight hours. So I'm it's sorry. Like, <laughs> yeah, I, it's not, I'm not ignoring you specifically. I'm Tim, just doing other stuff. Tim and I are actually thinking about transferring our consciousness to robot like beings <laughs> so that we can be awake 24 hours a day <laughs> And never have to feed ourselves or sleep to be to be able to answer all questions. But until we do that, we are human. We, you know, do have to make time for other things, and so we can't always respond right away. This is this is devolving, and we're a little punchy, as you may gather, on this Friday afternoon after a very long week of dealing with this yet again for now, uh, you know, a month straight. So, um, bef before we get ourselves into trouble, let's pivot right into let's talk. Substance. Let's pivot pivot into the substance of the pod. So let's get started. So Russia. Um, so let me, let me start with a question before I kind of go through and catalog everything that's happened since the last recording. For you, Mr. O'Toole, anything, uh, what is the, maybe the most interesting or surprising thing that has happened the last few weeks since we last recorded? And, and that can be really anything. And now, you know, I think we have the benefit, obviously, of a few weeks of hindsight and a few weeks of questions and a few weeks of real world observations about how this is all playing out, what the impact is, how people are responding. So what do you think? What is the most sort of interesting or surprising thing that's come of the, you know, maybe the first wave of sanctions that we spent the last episode talking about? I 
think it's how well the coalition has held together through some pretty stressful moments, and particularly with respect to the um, the initial decision not to impose sanctions on the energy industry, because and presumably because, and I, I think I've read this in a lot, a lot of places, and it makes sense, because Europe really needs the Russian energy products and would it would crash their economy to do without them. Uh, you know, there's been pressure outside of Europe to really crack down on the energy sector. And we've seen a little of that, but it really hasn't broken the coalition because it's been all of these new sanctions have really been inward fo focusing. So like the oil import ban for the U.S. just affects the U.S. So it's just oil imports and, you know, it's not a huge portion of our economy. And so we've been able to do that without kind of cracking the multilateral coalition. But I think just to me, what's so surprising is how well the coalition has held because multilateral sanctions are hard and they don't happen very often. Yeah, I would say that's a that's a a very good point and and what i'm my sort of observation on this is you know i think when <laughs> when the history of sanctions is written someday um perhaps we will write that history um i think this first few weeks is going to be just a just an incredibly fascinating test case on on sort of intended and unintended and secondary and tertiary consequences and how people respond to things and have not responded to things um and in particular, how, you know, obviously the first domino that was intentionally felled by the U.S. and the allies was the Russian financial sector. And we talked a lot the last time about the 10 biggest banks in Russia that have been targeted for whether blocking sanctions or lesser sanctions by the U.S. Um, and that that has not surprisingly proved to be central to everything that has been going on uh, in in all of the responses. And, and in fact, I had multiple discussions today with clients that I that I talked to during week one post invasion when the sanctions were just getting rolled out, who were telling me at the time, look, you know, executive level, board level at the company, we're committed to staying in Russia. We're committed to not picking up and leaving. We, you know, we, we feel comfortable that we're going to be able to comply with the new prohibitions. We can, um, you know, do X and Y and Z on the sanctions front, the payments front, the exports front, we can manage it. Talk to them today, decisions have been made, we're, we're leaving, we're, put, we're picking up, we're winding down, and we now need your help with figuring out how to do that in a compliant way so that we don't step in it on the way out of, out of the way out. And also, oh, by the way, we also want to manage the sensitive situation where we don't want to offend maybe our distributors and partners in Russia because we want to reserve the right to maybe come back in a couple of years if things change. And so how do we do all of that? And, and the complexity and the interconnectivity of all of this um, and the way it's been playing out and the way that the private sector has responded to this, like for those who are following this, there are no international law firms that are going to remain in Russia. The last of them announced this week that they're pulling up and leaving. That's a big deal. That's a very big deal. You know, to Tim's point about the energy sector, maybe it hasn't hit head on, but most of the leading energy sectors that had a big presence in Russia and invested in Russia have announced on their own that they're leaving, right? So, so this is, and so I think it's just fascinating to see the way that this is now playing out and in some ways gaining a momentum all, all its own. And so, you know, we're kind of, we're still in the early days of this and, and how it all ultimately shakes out will be fascinating. Yeah, the one thing I would add to that is I think you can see from the Russian side how this is playing out too. I think the initial response to the sanctions was we're prepared. We were ready for this. You told us they were coming. We've got a plan and these are not going to affect us any more than the 2014 sanctions affected us. And, you know, and then after the central bank went on on the list in the foreign currency reserves were placed off limits, that started to shake a little bit. But more recently, I mean, you're seeing these really strict, you know, criminal countermeasures to try and keep companies from actually either complying with the sanctions or getting out of Russia or or both. And and they've amped up almost as 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 more and more companies have made the decision to leave, the the Russian response has gotten more and more harsh to that. And 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 I think that it's not you know, it's not a coincidence. Yeah. And there's a, there's obviously a, a whiff of desperation and all of that, that, um, you know, that Putin and company are trying to prevent the complete and utter collapse of their economy, which, you know, may already be well on its way to happening at the rate we're going here. 
And, um, you know, one, one other final kind of fascinating thought to the point that Tim, um, just raised about, um, you know, we're prepared. There was a, just today, earlier today, um, president Biden had a lengthy discussion with president Xi in China about Russia. And of course the party line in China is we, we don't agree with, or, um, you know, uh, approve of the U S and other coercive tactics to impose sanctions on Russia, because China, of course, for their own reasons, uh, never wants that to be, uh, directed in their, uh, their way. And, um, we've talked about this quite a bit, even in the lead up to the invasion and, and the last time, you know, how the U S is going to handle China and China's response and China clearly wanting to be in the, in the, in the mix here as a, as Russia's benefactor, probably mostly for selfish reasons, obviously, to, to b- reap the economic benefits that the West is no longer going to reap from Russia, number one, but also to set the stage for what they may want to do down the road with respect to Taiwan or, or otherwise. And we've talked about this a lot. And the critical question, and, and this is, again, at the moment, this is, um, you know, perhaps other than to the, the trade nerd community, this is a little sort of far afield and not of immediate concern, but sort of what what lessons does China take from all of this and the response that has happened globally and, and led by the U.S.? What does the U.S. decide to do to signal to China that we are in, we are prepared to impose similar or greater pain on you if you intervene in a way we don't approve of with respect to Russia and Ukraine, or if you should try anything similar on your end? That is a really fascinating question and is going to have massive, massive consequences for the global world order for <laughs> decades to come. And, and that is, that is kind of bubbling just below the surface. And again, there was a two hour discussion between the, the, the two leaders of the two most, uh, you know, consequential economies in the world today about that. And it's just, that's a, that's a big one that we have to keep our eye on. It's huge. And it's already factoring into some of the advice we're giving to clients. I mean, so, so one of the things that's, unique about the Russian sanctions and how effective they've been is that there really aren't any secondary sanctions that are attached. I mean, theoretically, there's a provision of 14024 that has a material support provision that could be applied to non-US transactions, but as a practical- There's still CATSA 228. There's still CATSA 228 and and that sort of thing, although it's not totally clear that that applies to this round of sanctions because they've gone out of their way not to mention CATSA as supporting authority. But all that said, I, they, they, the, the both OFAC and the um, policymakers at Treasury and in the White House have made very clear that these are, you know, U.S. person-based sanctions at this point. And what I've told clients is that'll probably hold unless and until China starts to um, make a dent in these sanctions. And if that happens, either secondary sanctions will come or these material support provisions and these CATSA provisions will spring to life and start to be used against China. And I suspect that um, when Jake Sullivan met with the Chinese uh, foreign minister in Rome earlier this week and when President Biden and President Xi spoke today, that topic came up either directly, I suspect it came up directly in the Rome meeting, and I suspect it came up indirectly in the talks today um, because my view is that that the the U.S. is not inclined to really be the the um, be the police person on this unless and until China gets involved. And and if China does, I think the U.S. will start to try and invoke the U.S. financial system in a way that we haven't seen so far throughout these sanctions. Yeah, and in particular with the point that I started with about Russia's financial sector, as that continues to sink deeper and in, into deeper and deeper depths there's some suggestion clearly that the the chinese you know banking sector is the lifeline that could keep that afloat and you know if they intervene in a big way with respect to certain of these russian banks that may be um you know in trouble then it will be a very interesting question to see what uh the white house and treasury decide to do about that if anything and and so yeah, I, I agree. I think that's those are the big picture questions that I think everybody should be kind of keeping in the back of your minds or thinking about. I mean, we're, we're before we get into some of the nitty gritty of what's happened the last couple of weeks, I, I do think it's, um, you know, it is useful to kind of remember that there are some of these, you know, hugely consequential weighty questions that are kind of floating around out there 
around all of this. And, uh, you know, people have called this, you know, the end of the post Cold War era and, and all the rest of it. And whatever this next era is going to be, I think these are some of the defining questions that are going to set the set the table for that. Yeah, one more point on that, because I think that, that again, as quickly as some of the sanctions issues have changed, as quickly as some of the foreign policy issues have changed, I think that, that China's view, at least from observing from the outside of this conflict, has uh, evolved almost as rapidly. I think at the outset, it sure seemed like China was set to support Russia in this and that, that it, it was at least implicitly analogizing what was going on to the situation in Taiwan, essentially a, 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 what the way that um, Putin was describing Ukraine as essentially a breakaway Russian province was, was similar to, I think, the Chinese view as to Taiwan. I, I think that, uh, and I suspect that China has been uh, a little bit um, discouraged, I think uh, I'll use that word for now, as to how this has played out for Russia. And I think that uh, to the extent China was in in inclined to engage in sort of copycat behavior, I think their initial thinking was the same as at least it's been reported that Putin's thinking was, which was, this is going to be fast, P it'll be ugly, but people, but it will go away quickly because we're just going to march in, we're going to basically take take the government out, we're going to put our own government in, and then we're going to come back to Moscow, and it will be relatively quick, relatively painless, and the world will scream, and then they will go back, everything will go back to normal relatively quickly. That is not happening, and it's not happening anytime soon, and it might never happen, and the, the way that, you, that Europe has responded to this, I think, has shocked both China and Russia. I think that the way that the... Um, that this has been portrayed in the media, and I think you know accurately portrayed in the media, has been, I think shocked both China and Russia. And I think that uh, to the extent China was looking at to to Putin for kind of a role model on this, I think they they may be rethinking that decision. And at least recently, like in the last week or so, my my understanding is that China has started to turn down Russian requests for assistance in a way that wasn't happening at the beginning. And so that'll be interesting to watch as well, because I I think everybody saw those analogies to Taiwan at the beginning, and I think China saw them too. But I, I'm not sure that China is looking to kind of you know um, walk into this sort of complete and utter mess that Russia has walked into. Um, it may not seem as appealing now as it might have three weeks ago. Yeah, no, agreed, agreed. So with that, let's, um, let's pivot to kind of do a quick rundown of everything that's happened in the last two and a half weeks. So just like the last time, caveating this by saying if we were actually going to catalog everything um, that happened in the last you know, two and a half to three weeks, we would be here for five hours and, and this would put everybody to sleep. So um, in a similar vein, we are just like the last time about to publish uh, a lengthy uh, client alert that sort of runs through all of this in, in some detail, but um, in terms of everything that's come up in the last couple of weeks, but we'll run through quickly some of the highlights and, and then maybe we can, we can hit on a couple of uh, sort of interesting aspects of what's come out and we'll, and we'll do the same thing that we did the last time, which was we'll kind of start with, the various sanctions measures um, that have been uh, imposed, and then we'll we'll pivot to export controls. So, um, actually, I'm going to not go entirely in chronological order because I think the two kind of biggest things that have happened the last couple of weeks are the two new executive orders that came out last week. So the first one came out on March 8, and that was EO 14066, and that is um, the the executive order that imposed the ban, as Tim already alluded to, the import ban on certain Russian origin oil and gas products, crude oil, petroleum, et cetera. Um, it also prohibited new investments by U.S. persons in, in the Russian energy sector. So um, obviously that's a pretty big deal. And there are a lot of, um, I think, thorny issues that kind of go along with this that we've already seen and we know are kind of bouncing around the, again, the trade nerd community at the moment, in particular, um, you know, understanding what these, what types of products these bans apply to, um, and you know whether or not there has been, um, you might be in a situation where uh, there's a claim that these um, these items are substantially transformed in another country, and therefore they're not Russian origin, um, the, and and those types of issues. So 
um, that's, that's been, you know, we know that's been keeping a lot of people busy. That was the beginning of last week. Um, later in the week, last week, we got EO 14068, which is the March 11 executive order. Um, and that one, um, added some, added some more import bans. So we have certain, uh, I would call them kind of, uh, signature Russian origin products like fish and seafood, alcoholic beverages, um, diamonds of certain types, et cetera. Um, luxury goods, which the commerce department has later come out with further guidance, um, and, um, on what is covered by the luxury good import ban. Um, and that's a, that's at least symbolically sort of a pretty big one. Um, the broadened sort of new investment bar in any sector of the Russian economy, which obviously leaves open the possibility that the U S could target literally just about anything, uh, going forward if it want, if it so chooses. And then, um, an interesting one, which there has been a lot of chatter about, which is the, um, the export re-export sales supply from the U S um, of U S dollar nominated banknotes to either the Russian Federation directly or any person in Russia. Um, and there's a little bit of, there's a little, has been at least a little bit of confusion on the guidance there because it seems pretty clearly to contemplate that, you know, personal remittances of U S banknotes are still permitted. However, the way that it's, um, and, and then that raises the question of whether this only applies to physical banknotes, not wire transfers of U S dollars and some of the guidance and, um, and the GL that was issued in connection with that, um, GL 18, I believe, if I'm not getting that number wrong, um, is, uh, a little ambiguous on that. So there's been a lot of chatter on that front as well. Uh, another one, uh, to sort of keep in mind in between the issuance of these new executive orders or around them. One thing that we talked about the last time that did come about just a couple of days later was the SWIFT ban. And so we mentioned that the U S and, um, EU partners had come um, to consensus that they were going to uh, pull a certain number of Russian banks off of the SWIFT system. And that actually happened on March 2nd. And the seven banks in total, including a couple of very large ones, VTB and VEB in particular, and a number of others that were subject that are subject to other sanctions that were recently imposed. So seven banks in total from Russia taken off SWIFT. But um, you know, to Tim's point and to some of the points we talked about earlier, not everybody, not, not Sparebank, not some of the other, you know, largest Russian banks, they have not been taken off in part, I think, in deference to the wishes of the European, European allies who don't want to completely, uh, kind of shut down those, those channels to get, uh, funds in and out of Russia at the moment. Um, three, but interestingly, three Belarusian banks also, uh, are about to be pulled off the Swiss system as well. That's going to happen uh, over the weekend, actually, I believe. So that hasn't happened yet, but that got announced. And that's just more of a the trend that we've seen, which is that Belarus, who's kind of been identified as a, you know the leading aider and a better co-conspirator to Russia in the invasion, is is being sort of hit with similar um, you know sanctions of a similar um, uh, measure over the course of the last couple of weeks, and um, and so th- this kind of follows suit there. Along along with this, there have been a whole host of additional designations, many, many, many designations, including against um, some who are involved in intelligence and dif- disinformation campaigns, some who are involved in human rights abuses, more kind of wealthy ar- oligarchs and members of Putin's inner circle. So I'd, I've even lo- I've lost track of how many new new SDNs have been named in the last couple of weeks. It's a large number, and OFAC continues to sort of pump those out on a regular basis um, as we as we go uh, along here each and every week. Um, along with that, of course, and along with everything that we're talking about, a good number of general licenses and FAQs that are coming along with each the issuance of the new executive orders, the issuance of all of these new um, these new designations. So uh, for anybody who has kind of specific issues that they're digging into on any of these fronts, obviously, First place to look is sort of is sort of there on the OFAC website as to whether there might be a GL or an FAQ that's going to speak to any of these things. Um, and then there's a whole host of other things that are that are also in the works. So beyond obviously, um, you know, we already spoke to some of the uh, the import bans. There's also the um, Russia's uh, MFN status, which is in in jeopardy and looks like it's about to be um, pulled, which is going to uh, deny Russia the benefits of its membership in the WTO. Um, the U.S. Uh, Congress is in the, is in the midst of 
uh, working through and, and potentially passing legislation to put on President Biden's desk to do that. That may happen very quickly. Um, so that's that's, again, another thing that's in the works that's kind of closely tied to everything that we're seeing here. Um, I'll, I'll stop there as, as sort of the, the, my summary of everything that's happened, because again, there's a lot more detail we could get into, but I'll, I'll stop there and throw it to you, Mr. O'Toole. So among that group of actions, again, sort of anything that sort of stands out to you, anything that, you know, you're hearing from clients that's particularly vexing at this point in terms of trying to manage or, or, um, you know, navigate among any of the things that I, that we just sort of ran through that are, that are new in the last two weeks. So. A couple of things. I mean, it's funny. I mean, we've had questions, so many questions on almost all of these topics already, which is pretty unusual. I mean, we were getting questions on the export controls, um, the new export controls before they, before were, even the, before they were even published. They weren't no. published in the Federal Register. Now, that's in part because the BIS has determined that it can actually make things effective before they're published, which... Um, presents Query it, whether that would stand up under a lawsuit, but yeah, I, I would think that under the APA that it would not be um, a, a rational use of administrative procedure to say you've got to provide notice to people that there's a regulation, but oh by the way, you can start to impose penalties before the regulation is even published. But that is what the regulation does, and as I've uh, I've advised all of my clients, don't be the one to test that. Like you know, if you can comply with it, comply with it. It does make compliance very challenging when you don't even have the public published rule when you're supposed to be complying with it. But but there you are. Um, I think that you know from what I've seen, there there are going to be a lot of questions as this works itself out, and I think part of the problem too is that you know there's a lot of regs coming out, but then a lot of guidance following more quickly, and as I think you pointed out, one of the pieces of guidance that doesn't quite seem consistent with the language of the executive order. I mean, the the president said no banknotes to Russia, and then you've got some guidance that suggests that banknotes could include wire transfers, which doesn't make any sense, and and really doesn't any, make any sense. The way that the rest of the guidance and the rest of the reg is written, but but there you have it. I mean, there is guidance that that makes that the term banknotes unclear, um, and and makes it very difficult to advise that banknotes mean banknotes. You can say that's my view of it, but you know, I I, I look at this guidance and now I got to scratch my head. I I think the other area, the other two areas that I've seen. Um, you know, there's some ambiguity in in this these wind down provisions with respect to the the oil import ban that came out. Um, I think it was on March 8th. And then a, a question that I now have into OFAC that I think is at least worth raising and talking about a little bit. So because I I don't know how it plays out, but I I do want to flag it for people out there who are listening. So when the 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 executive order that uh, placed a, a that that allowed for controls and and prohibited exports of luxury goods to Russia delegated the power to the Commerce Department. But the language of the executive order actually said that it was unlawful, uh, it, it was prohibited for both um, the goods that were defined for any, to, to send them to a Russian party, but it also used the term U.S. persons. So the prohibition applied to U.S. persons. Now, the only the only regs that have come out since then uh, have been Commerce Department regulations that don't apply to U.S. persons at all. They don't mention the term U.S. persons, but they 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 apply to goods subject to the EAR. So query whether if you have goods that are not subject to the EAR that are sent to to Russia, luxury goods, um, and a U.S. person is involved, is that a problem? Because the executive order would suggest yet. Yeah, Yes, but the Commerce Department, which is given the delegated the authority to create rules with respect to the executive order, says says no. And so I I don't know the answer to that question. I mean, the 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 safe advice that I would give is the executive order prohibits U.S. persons from doing this, so you're going to have to comply with that by not having U.S. persons involved in the transport of luxury goods or the sale of luxury goods to Russia, even though they're not regulated by the Commerce Department. So the, the moral of the story there is if you're a U.S. person who's over in Milan at the moment, stocking up on expensive Italian handbags, thinking that you're going to ship them over to Russia because they're not those handbags are not subject to the AR, think twice before you do that based on the ambiguity that Tim just raised. It's exactly right. It's exactly right. You've got all of these sorts of conundrums. I mean, and, and, you know, in the same way, like, you know, if you are 
importing expensive Russian vodka? Like, when do you have to get it into the country? Yeah. By? I mean, and, and I mean, look, I think that again, to the, um, the luxury goods, um, export ban and the, you know, some of the import bans in particular, not, not necessarily the crude oil, petroleum, you know, um, ban, but the, certainly the kind of, you know, signature Russian products like fish and seafood and alcohol, et cetera. I think if you look at those from a dollar standpoint, it's not a big, it's not a big amount, right? It's not a big volume. It's not a big percentage of the trade of the U S Russia trade. It's, these are, these are highly symbolic measures, obviously. And the, and the U S uh, is very fond of doing this. OFAC and others are very fond of doing this because it just, it sort of sends a real, um, you know, it sends a real, uh, uh, signal to the, to the Russians that, you know, we, we mean business and we're going to kind of hit you where it hurts, which is in these items, perhaps that you have a lot of pride in, or that, that maybe have value that is outsized their economic, their pure economic value. So that's one thing I would say. The other thing that I would say here too, is, um, you know, like we've seen in many other regimes that are kind of rapidly expanding. And obviously this is rapidly expanding at a pace that we've never seen before, quite frankly. Um, it, this is just mushrooming and growing exponentially kind of week by week in terms of the different aspects and elements that are being built out, new executive orders that are being rolled out, um, et cetera, is, you know, we now have the, um, we now have the new investment in any sector provision in EO 14068 now, which is obviously a, a you know, a, a clear signal that, um, Look, we could come for any, we could come for anything, right? All bets are off here, and and we've seen this before. We've seen this with Venezuela. We've seen this in other programs where, um, you know, recently in Burma, we've seen that the U.S. kind of loves to do. This is like a favored tactic of how these are now designed, because it gives so much flexibility and so much weight to the potential kind of future future directions. And we actually got a call, a, a question earlier today about something about this, which is, well, how am I going to talk to clients about whether they should be worried about this? And the reality is that, you know, obviously this, this, this isn't just kind of self-activating that, you know, the treasury and state department and others have to confer and decide what sectors they're, they're going to target for these bans and then take some, take some steps to, you know, to, to designate people or to sanction people. But as a practical matter, if you're advising companies or you are in a company where you're thinking about whether we could be impacted by this, you know, you really do have to take a hard look at the industry that you're in and the industries you interface with and whether or not that you you could be next on the list. I mean, another thing related to this um, that has become a fascinating kind of point of discussion that I know I've had this come up multiple times in the last couple of weeks is everybody is sort of paying attention um, you know, I think OFAC and the U.S. sanctions still lead the way and are the, of greatest interest and are of great and kind of strike the most fear in people around the world. But because allies and in particular the EU and the U.K. are being very forward leaning on their actions as well, there's a lot of tea leaf reading about what the U.K. and the EU are doing and whether or not it's just a matter of time before the the before OFAC goes after these same individuals. There are some very high profile um wealthy Russian persons that have been sanctioned in the UK or the EU of late that are not sanctioned yet by the US, by OFAC, so-called oligarchs, which is a, a friend. So called I say so-called oligarch because we had a discussion about that term, a very deep philosophical discussion about that term and what a loaded term that is and, and how that's become kind of a marketing tagline for the US and others to just kind of smear the various individuals that are being um, sanctioned here. And look, sometimes Clearly, I think it's warranted. Other times, perhaps not. So we're just throwing that out there. But I think this is this has created a big. Um, it's kind of a hornet's nest of of activity that is, is you know bubbling around all of these different regimes. And now there's a lot of oh wait a minute, so and so was was just sanctioned in the UK, and now and I'm not going to mention names because <laughs> some of these impact our clients directly, and some of these. Uh, you know, impact other companies that we uh, do uh, provide advice to. So we're not going to name any no names. names. This is on a no names basis. This is on a no names basis. But obviously, um, that that's become kind of a fascinating exercise. Is that there's so much, so many people being sanctioned, so many companies being sanctioned that I think trying to evaluate what's really in play, what's really at risk, and how do we make decisions about whether we have to get out immediately, whether there's a you know 
10% chance that this entity or this person might be sanctioned or a 50% chance by the US. I, you know, it's, that's really difficult stuff to try to navigate yet. It has a actual practical impact on many, many, many companies um, all around the world at this point. And these are the types of discussions that, you know, we, we're having with our clients and we know are happening kind of all over the place. So I just sort of throw that out there, you know, just as an observation and also as a, you know, a thing for people to chew over a little bit and think about how you, how you, you know, if you're sitting and thinking about these same things, like what kind of, what, if any kind of, you know, analytical framework are you using to try to even make sense of all of this? And, and we, we grant you that there's a lot of chaos here that it's, it's hard to make sense of it to some degree, but um, certainly we're trying to, we're trying to do that on a daily basis. And, you know, I think well, that's a fight. it's a fight worth fighting to some degree. Yeah. What we're seeing now is what you see in a lot of heavily sanctioned areas where it just becomes such a compliance challenge that the, the ultimate People just decision give up. is just give up. Yeah. I mean, yeah. and, and you're seeing it with companies that are in Russia. You're seeing it with banks. The, you know, banks are, I think, systematically reviewing their Russian transactions and saying, hey, um, no, 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 no. You know, it, rather than coming in and saying, okay, so, you know, is this a transaction that doesn't involve the sanctioned bank? Does it involve a sanctioned sector? Um, to turn back to the question that you were talking about that we, we got some form of earlier today, I mean, at some point, maybe OFAC and BIS are going to combine their superpowers and OFAC is going to start, you know, retroactively designating financial sectors, you know, where they'll essentially say, you know, operating in the Russian financial sector as of last week. And, you know, you've got to comply with something that you didn't even have any notice of. But at least so far, I mean, when, when OFAC has been designating these financial sectors and, and had these open-ended executive orders that said, you know, operating in the, any sector of the Russian economy that the Secretary of Treasury designates, there usually is a little bit of a lag, like they'll start on February 22 by designating the financial sector, and then they'll start, you know, putting banks on the list because they're operating in the Russian financial sector. So it is usually prospective, but maybe one day um, they'll talk to BIS and BIS will say, no, we don't need to deal with that. Why should you do that at all? You can, you can ban it today and then have it take effect as of last week. For anybody who's wondering, Tim is raising this because he would love to bring that lawsuit if exactly. anybody out there ever has that happen to them. So yeah. just remember that. And let me be very that. clear. Comply as best you can yeah. with these retroactive <laughs> provisions. Do not be the test case. But if, yes. you, if you are the test case, you know, we're here. We're listening. Yes. Um, all right. With that, let's let's pivot quickly to cover some of the export controls developments and then we'll and then we'll uh, wrap for for now. Um, so. Um, you know, a lot of still a lot of activity on the export control side as well. I think um, maybe three or four big highlights in the last couple of weeks. So number one, um, the export controls uh, expansion that we explained the last time that has uh, drastically increased the um, items that are subject to licensing requirements and put in place um, new foreign direct product rules have basically been replicated and expanded to cover Belarus as well as Russia. So we already mentioned that Belarus is kind of, um, is, is getting targeted now to the same degree as Russia. Um, and, and that was March two, that that was, um, announced that that was going to go into effect with respect to Belarus. Um, another big one that happened a couple of days after that is, um, as, as I'm sure most of you listening here know, there have been for many years since, um, 2014 or thereabouts after the um, annexation of Crimea, there were um, specific export controls that were put in place under um, Part 746 of the EAR to restrict the export of certain items that relate to um, certain oil, uh, ref oil refining and other energy products or projects in Russia. Um, that somewhat mirror the restrictions uh, or the scope of restrictions that, that were covered under uh, Directive 4 as well. Those have now been further expanded um, and uh, on March 4, as of March 4. And so to the extent that anybody um, has has anything to do with the um, the oil refining or the energy sector um, would certainly, and is, and is exporting anything that was previously subject to those rules or could be now subject to those rules, would certainly encourage you to take a close look at that. Um, South Korea was added a couple of days later to the um, the exclusion rule, which is basically that 
for purposes of the new foreign direct product rules. And South Korea had impl implemented their own restrictions. And so um, anything that's produced in South Korea is, is not going to be subject to the new uh, FTP rules. And then, um, as we already talked about quite a bit, BIS was given authority to um, uh, to set forth controls on the uh, and restrict the uh, export of luxury goods. And so that came out um, about a week ago on March 11. And that has now um, been put out. And the new there's a new supplement, Supplement 5 under Part 746 that deals with the luxury goods. And so it's quite not, broad, too. Yeah, I mean, that, it that, is. That surprised me at how broad and how specific it was. Yeah. So. So I think that's I I would say those are those are kind of the biggest developments on the export control side of things. Any any sort of further thoughts, comments on on any of that at the moment? I mean, you've already covered a good one that kind of hits on that crosses the bridge between the luxury goods on both sides of uh, OFAC and BIS. But anything else? No, I mean I. I I, I've been a little hard on BIS. I mean, I, let's let's we love you, BIS. Let's be nice to them too. All because respect, I, to I do. BIS. I have I have friends there, and and I I do respect that they have a really hard job to do, especially right now. And I will say that I thought that the the regs themselves have been quite good. Like, you know, on the one hand, I'm not crazy about their effective dates, but I'm but I am impressed with how quickly that they've been able to bring together some pretty comprehensive regs on these. And and as hard as as we've been working, I think that our friends at BIS and OFAC have probably probably been working even harder. So kudos to them for all of the, the work that they're doing on these sanctions issues. And I am really impressed with how they've been using sanctions and export controls like a like a scalpel and not like a, you know, like a meat cleaver, like it has happened with some of the other programs. No sleep for the trade nerd community in Washington, D.C., whether private sector or public sector. So um, I think that's right. So um Okay, with that, maybe any any final thoughts before we sort of we sort of wrap up um, our Russia rundown for for today. I mean, I think one one thought I'll leave everybody with, which I think we we sort of hit on you know hard the last time, and obviously that has proven to be true, is that you know expect that this is going to continue to evolve, continue to expand, continue to change in you know unanticipated ways um, over the next few weeks and and beyond. And, you know, you just have to be from a compliance standpoint, you just have to be hyper vigilant at this point. I think anybody who has any exposure or dealings with any Russia related anything just has to be um, really doing their level best to just stay stay on top of this. And that goes not just for folks in the States, but anywhere. And, and you know, I'd say um, to that to that point, I mean, we're, I, you know, we're we're getting we're literally getting calls from all around the world at this point, And and, you know, I think everybody is appreciating the magnitude of this and the and the challenge here and, and trying to, you know, is trying to do their best to comply and to figure out what they need to do to make sure they don't, uh, you know, get tripped up here uh, in the early days of, of all these new rules and prohibitions. Yeah, I've got kind of two parting thoughts on this. First, enforcement. So obviously it's too early to see enforcement yet, but there's a lot of enforcement efforts going on and a lot of talk coming from the enforcement agencies that this that these sanctions are going to be enforced um, more vigorously than, than any others, or at least you know as as vigorously as the Iran sanctions have been, which I think are the, probably the high point of enforcement other than these. I'll be curious to see if that happens. I think it will. I think a lot of resources and attention are being devoted to those issues, but it's really far too soon to tell because these sanctions have been so recent, although they are effective. And so I'll be curious to see how quickly enforcement ramps up. The other thing is, is I'll also, and it's related, is whether we're kind of close to the end. I mean, I, I think that the only place that I would have predicted sanctions would go or export controls would go with respect to Russia um, is the energy sector. We, they, that really hasn't been hit hard. And I think it, it kind of goes back to the initial point that I raised about the, the multilateral coalition holding. I mean, that's where it will break. That's where Europe and the US kind of, and particularly you know the US and Germany to be more concrete about it, potentially part ways because Germany and, and the rest of, of Europe for, the, for you know what's Europe now after Brexit um, are quite dependent on, on Russian oil. And, you know, now that the winter is ending, maybe they're less dependent for a little while, but they're still quite dependent on Russian oil. And so it's not a coincidence that the wind down license lasts until mid-June. 
Uh, it's not a coincidence, in my view, that the that despite the strong pressure to cut back on Russian energy, the measures that have been taken have been kind of country by country and really related to import and not really related to Russian energy sales generally. There haven't been hasn't been any real move to cut off the banks from financing transactions in the energy sector. No real move to cut down on the general license that allows this to go on until June. I'm curious both to see whether that that dynamic holds till June, and then what happens after June? Do, do, do the energy sector sanctions start to increase? It's really the only place that I could see them going bigger, um, and I'll be curious to see whether that happens. Yeah, one. I'll just make one final comment to, to build on the enforcement point that you raised, which is, for those who aren't aware, um, there is a multilateral oligar- Russian oligarch task force, which of course has the pithy... Um, uh, you know, abbreviation of it's, it's known as the Russian elites, proxies and oligarchs repo multilateral task force, which was announced by the white house. I think on the day we actually recorded the last pod, they had the first virtual meeting it's chaired by, or sort of led by the attorney general and the secretary of treasury. And then involves the, I think the finance ministers and other senior government officials from many different allied countries who, who are, who are very closely aligned on all of this. And it's designed to go after and stop sanctions evasion, money laundering, seize and freeze assets of sanctioned Russian oligarchs and other, you know, individuals, et cetera. So they've, they've made a lot of noise around this. They, they love to have, uh, as a DOJ alum, I know that they love, they love task force, task forces over at DOJ. They love to announce these things big and noisy, you know, that, does suggest that there's a surging of resources, obviously, to try to uh, accomplish these goals. But you know what comes out of it, I, I, it'll be interesting to see. To Tim's point, we're too early to really know what the enforcement cadence is going to look like here. But but that's another piece of it that I think we're going to see, um, along with perhaps you know more designations, more um, you know more civil monetary penalties, etc. By on the OFAC side of things. So. Um, just another, just another thing to keep in mind as, as, as things evolve here. So with that, let's leave Russia behind sort of, although it's going to come up in the last discussion. Um, and let's pause for the lightning round sound effect. Uh, one topic today, JCPOA 2.0. So, uh, just quickly for those who haven't been following this because you've been preoccupied with Russia or other things. Um, the latest news coming out of Vienna is that they are very close to a deal for the U.S. to re-enter the JCPOA and for Iran to get back in compliance with its obligations under the deal, um, there has been a bit of intrigue the last couple of weeks because Russia, who is a signatory to the deal, was making some noise that it would not um, approve, bless, or otherwise sign on to a new deal if there were going to be if there was going to be a threat of sanctions by the U.S. or others against them for either conducting business with Iran under this new deal, or perhaps even in connection with the sanctions that are being levied against them uh, for the invasion of Ukraine. It seems as if that maybe has subsided and Russia is not going to stand in the way of this, but um, you, you know, we shall see. And now it looks like uh, by the latest news accounts that are coming out just today, that there may be in fact effectively a written agreement or understanding for the re-entry of the U.S. to the JCPOA or JCPOA 2.0, as we like to call it, and for Iran to come back into compliance as well. Um, of course, Iran says, well, the ball's in the U.S. court, and the U.S. has to decide if it's going to get on board with this, and the U.S. says, well, the ball's in Iran's court, and they have to decide if they're going to comply. And everybody says, we don't have a lot of time. That We're finally here at the end, and if we can't get it done here, it's never going to happen. So with that, I throw it to you, Mr. O'Toole. If you're looking into your crystal ball, and based on what you're seeing and hearing in the press, what do you what do you think we're gonna what do you think is gonna happen with all this? And um, do we think God. Russia is gonna find a way to foul this up? I think so. I mean, it's sad that we can't even talk about Iran anymore without talking about Russia. I it mean, is. Russia has just spilled <laughs> over into any, everything. I mean, we've now had like the last four podcasts, and we've barely talked about China. We've barely talked about Iran. It's all Russia all the time, and even the JCPOA story is really 
all about Russia right now because in my, some ways it is. Yes. I mean, the deal was cut by all accounts. There really had it was being finalized, and then Russia swooped in and basically said no, no deal unless we're you know the sanctions on us are part of it, which is insane, right? I mean, it. it it's just as much bad faith as the U.S. bad faith in withdrawing from the deal in 2018, and so, so if not more, because at least you know when they withdrew from the deal in 2018, they didn't withdraw from like nine other deals that had nothing to do with Iran, and that's what Russia coming in and talking about the Russia sanctions in the context of the JCPOA negotiations is like. But I, I, I think it's really going to come down to what Russia wants. Now, my understanding is that the Iranian foreign minister went to Russia and met with uh, Putin yesterday or the day before, and um, that people became more optimistic after that meeting. But if Russia wants to mess this deal up, it can. Um, I guess the question is how much heat it's willing to take in Iran and, and with some of the uh, some of the European countries. With respect to the European countries, I'm, I imagine that it's not worried about the heat because the heat can't get turned up much higher. With Iran, it can. Um, you know, I, my understanding is that at least officially Iran is against the invasion of Ukraine by Russia, but it hasn't been that vocal about it. I think that you know it could be another country that is mobilized against Russia, and Iran would have a real grievance with Russia if it were to to mess up the deal at the one yard line. But I, I just I'm I'm giving up I think on predicting what's going to happen with the JCPOA because just when I think that it's there, it's not there. I think the last time I took the under, you took the over. You were you were on the yes side, I was on the no side. Um, I do I do think that from all the reports coming out, it seems that the if assuming that Russia has actually abandoned its demand that perhaps certain sanctions directed its way that have nothing to do with Iran that are just purely Ukraine related be part of any discussions or part of, you know, their signing on to this. Um, what is coming out suggests that what they care about really is not being targeted for sanctions if they are going to sort of fully, um, you know, get back into the Iranian market uh, in with two feet after the sanctions relief comes. And, uh, you know, I think that the U.S. has given some somewhat kind of tepid um, reassurances there that, you know, we will comply with everything that you know, we are, we must comply with under the terms of the sanctions relief. And that sort of reading between the lines, it suggests Russia, we're not going to come after you if you, if you avail yourself of the opportunity to do business with Iran and it's compliant with the sanctions relief. So um, yeah, we shall see. I, I, I just don't know. I think you're right. I've, I've kind of given up deciding, um, you know, or, or trying to prognosticate I, here. I always come back to where I started with all this and which is you have two sides that want to get a deal done. You'd think you'd be able to get a deal done. And I think that that, that hasn't, that dynamic hasn't changed. It's why we're still here because I think in any normal deal, you know, a year and plus in where the, each side has basically said this should only take a few months, I think both sides would give up and walk away. And the reason they haven't is because I think fundamentally there should be a deal here. And, and I've always thought there would be a deal here, but now I'm just like every time it, gets close it gets messed up and so i don't I'm, i i don't and, I, and and honestly i you know today even i i saw reports that uh the Iranian nuclear program was doing things that it shouldn't under the deal, and that the IEA was, or I, the IAEA was, was, was making comments that suggested that Iran may not be able to comply with its nuclear commitments. So, so that is another thing that could obviously really mess up the deal, because from my perspective, the U.S. wants the deal because that's the benefit that it got and was getting in 2018 when the U.S. walked away, and and that's the benefit it wants to get back. If that's not going to happen, the U.S. will walk away from this deal as well. Right. I agreed. One other one sort of final parting thought to give you, which is if we if we're in a world where this deal does happen and isn't it's a fascinating thought experiment to think that it might be easier to do business in Iran than in Russia by the end of 2022. Um, and that but that could very well be the case, especially for it's also sort of related. Fascinating question is whether people who are a, were kind of burned the last time by their experience getting into Iran or just like, no, thank you. I'm just, I don't care what reassurances I have. There's no chance that I'm going to go back into this until I make sure that it sticks perhaps for some period of time. And two, um, those who are just dealing with the kind of fallout from the Russia situation and having had to pick up and leave Russia 
are going to have the stomach to deal with trying to get back into Iran, um, you know, let's say late this year, next year, whenever it's going to be. So again, I don't have answers to those questions necessarily, but just fascinating questions for, especially for those who are sitting in Europe who are the most likely to, you know, want to pursue this again. Yeah. And just on one of those points, Ryan, I mean, it's 2022 and now it's getting into the spring of 2022. If I were sitting in, in Europe and I see a JCPOA, let's say that it gets signed in April. That seems it, up. That seems up. And that's optimistic. <laughs> that's way optimistic. But let's say it's let's let's be as optimistic as possible. It gets signed in April and I've got to got to ramp up to start doing business in Iran again. And, and I, you know, we'll see the terms of whatever this JCPOA are, but the finance is going to be tough. The, the infrastructure is going to be tough. And, you know, the, if you look at public opinion polls in the U.S., the chances that Joe Biden will be reelected, I mean, you've got to put them at most at 50 percent at this point. And so if Joe Biden or whatever, whoever the Democratic nominee is not reelected, whoever the Republican nominee is, is going to campaign most likely on withdrawing from the JCPOA in 2025. So you've got three years, you've got at least a 50-50 shot that three years from now, the U.S. is going to walk away from the JCPOA again. Now, again, I'll be curious to see what protections are in the, the JCPOA to protect to, to stop that from happening. But it's hard to imagine that there could be any because it's just, you know, this is not a treaty. It's easy for a new president to undo what an old president has done if it's not at the treaty level. And so I just don't see how there could be the type of certainty with, with this new deal that would allow people to say, you know, I'm going to start throwing resources into the Iran market, even though, the you know, the old sanctions drove me out, um, knowing that two to three years from now, there's at least a 50-50 chance that those sanctions are going to come back into place. Well, I, I'll say this. I look forward to having many, many discussions about whatever the new version of General License H is <laughs> and whether or not U.S. companies can allow their um, their foreign subs to get back to get into Iran um, and ultimately having most of them decide it's too hard, right. which, uh, <laughs> which I, which is precisely what happened the first time and is right. probably almost certainly going to be exactly the way it gets analyzed the, the next time. So, um, w but with Tim's eloquent sort of takedown of the sort of fundamental flaw of this whole thing, you know, we'll, we'll see if that, uh, m many loyal embargoed listeners around the table in Vienna. So, that might be enough right, to move the needle right. just based on Tim's comments. There. No, no, I look, I, I, I think this trade deal makes sense for so many reasons that I hope they do it. But boy, I, I just don't know how you fix that problem of, of the fact that it could go away, you know, in two and a half years. Like, how do how, how does anybody rely on a deal that is that, you know, there's a 50 50 chance that it's a two year shelf life? Yeah, well. I have no answers to that. So with that, we will leave you to ponder until our next episode, which um, will be uh, this will be up sometime next week. Uh, we'll be back early April. Who knows where we'll be at that point with Russia or anything else. Maybe we'll manage to talk about something other than Russia the next time. Maybe we'll force ourselves to talk about something other than Russia the next time, um, you know, just for our own amusement. But um, in any event, uh any any final thoughts before we uh, before we shut it down for this long eventful week? I want to talk about Venezuela next time. I think we should sure. talk about there there may be some developments there, and I, I think that's, that's true. Let's 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 talk about Venezuela. That's true. We next won't time. we won't get, we won't step on the next pod, but yeah, there are there's some there's some sort of rumblings about maybe some things going on with Venezuela. So let's save that for next time. Maybe we can make it an all a non the non Russia episode that'll exactly. probably be the probably be the lowest listened to rated <laughs> episode in the history of exactly. embargoed, but because we buck the tide of public uh, of public interest to go in the complete right. opposite direction. We're trying but to make a podcast that nobody will listen to. We're doing That's our we're goal. doing we're doing one for you, one for us here <laughs> at embargoed. So exactly. um, anyway, uh, until next time, I uh, hope everybody stays well uh, and stays sanctions free. Stay sanctions free, everybody, and get some sleep. Bye, everybody. This podcast was produced by HeartCast Media.